Well, today we are in our Chosen series, and I hope you guys are loving the Chosen series. And if you have not yet watched it on TV, it's on Amazon Prime, it's on Peacock, you can look it up on the Chosen app. It is free, and it is the best series I have ever seen on bringing the gospels to life. So if you are in here and you've ever struggled with, I just can't sit down and commit to reading the whole chapter or a whole book in the Bible. Well, I, I double dog dare you to open up that Bible, but take it in front of your TV and watch the scriptures come to life through the chosen series. It's, it's just awesome. You know, today is Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday. And I wanna tell you what that means. We find it in scripture. And it's a time when Jerusalem is getting ready to be a packed city because it's about to be Passover week. And around this time when Jesus was also getting ready to enter Jerusalem for Passover week, there were 2 million people coming to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. That's 2 million men, women, children. Our city is just a little over 2 million. So imagine Jerusalem, much like Las Vegas, packed mountain to mountain, wall to wall with people coming in to celebrate. Well, you might be wondering, well, what were they celebrating? Well, Jews every year would get together to celebrate Passover. And Passover was a time to remember and to celebrate what God had done for the people of Israel hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And that is when the people of Israel were enslaved under Pharaoh and Egypt. And they were in such dire conditions that they cried out to their God, rescue me. And many of us know the story that God called on Moses and Moses got his brother Aaron and together they went and they went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Over and over and over again, they went to Pharaoh and made the plea for God's people. And God ended up rescuing the children of Israel, redeeming them, parting the Red Sea, setting them off into the promised land, telling them that you are a redeemed people and you are my people and I am your God. So here we are in the days of Jesus and everyone is getting ready to celebrate what God did. And they're gonna take seven to eight days of just celebration and remembering. They're gonna read scriptures together. They're gonna break bread together. They're gonna have special meals that represent the things that happened in the great exodus, they're, they're going to celebrate that God is good, come on, and he can still rescue, amen? Yeah. But what made this time so different is that Jesus is about to do something significant that would make this Passover not like any other Passover. And so we're gonna go to Luke chapter 19. It says, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, just like the other two million people were doing. And walking ahead of his disciples, as he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one else has ever ridden. I want you to untie it and bring it there. And if anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Now I'm a parent and I love this because Jesus went through line by line, step by step, what I need you to do. I need you to go in, you know, into town before me. You're gonna find a donkey, right? It's like I'm telling my child, you're gonna go to the refrigerator, you're gonna open the door, you're gonna find a brand new bottle of ketchup, right? <laughs> you're gonna take off the lid. I had another time, no, no, because you gotta peel back the thing. Right? I love Jesus. And he's like, and someone just might ask you, why are you taking this donkey that clearly is not yours? And you're gonna tell them the Lord needs it. So let's go on. It says, so they went and found the colt, just as Jesus said, right? If Jesus said it, I believe it, what? Because his word is true. And sure enough, as they were untying, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. Now, let me tell you why this is significant. Because not just anybody rides in on garments on a colt. But this is what happens. It says, as he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of them. And so they begin to take off their outer jackets and they begin to lie it on the road, lay it on the road as Jesus on this donkey, on this colt, began riding into town. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. And so many times, even I believe in Avenue Kids today and over the years, we've done crafts with your children to show them what the garments were coming off, that the palm leaves were laid and they were flung in the air as people shouted, praise God, our King has arrived. Now, what's so awesome about this 
is what Jesus is doing, riding in on this colt into Jerusalem on the week of Passover, actually is a 500 year old prophecy fulfillment. Palm Sunday is a fulfillment of a 500 year old prophecy. What do you mean, Lindsay? Well, in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah recorded, he was a prophet 500 years before this, he wrote this, rejoice, O people of Zion, Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble. And how is he humble? He's riding on a donkey and he's riding on a donkey's colt. See, this is incredible. You may wonder, is Jesus just something that just came about and and we just decided as Christians that we're gonna worship this man? and, And no, everything about Christ's life, beginning, to end, to resurrection, to ascending back to heaven. All of that was foretold in scripture. So not just Palm Sunday was foretold, but the crucifixion was foretold. The birth of Jesus was foretold. Even John the Baptist who prepared the way of the Lord, that was foretold in scripture. So from cover to cover, Old Testament or New Testament. It is all a story. It's all the unfolding of Jesus Christ being our salvation for all eternity. Amen and amen. But here's what what boggles my mind is that not only are you having these crowds gather together, but you're also having Pharisees, religious leaders. They're all gathering together. And see, they would have known about this. They would have looked on scripture because they didn't just sit in service. Sometimes we sit in service just like this and we hear a scripture for the very first time. And we're like, whoa, (laughs) never heard that before, right? You get on your U version to make sure we're not making stuff up and you check it out and it's really there. Or you open up your Bible, you're like, yes, I just read about this in church. Well, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they were not participants in a service. They were not simply students. They were scholars and they were teachers. So they would know that Jesus being on this cult, people shouting, rejoice, O Jerusalem, rejoice, Zion, your king has arrived. That should have not have been a surprise to them because they know their word. Yet it tells us here, but some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke. You know what that means? Shut their mouths. Rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And this is what I love about the Lord. Jesus replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. If they don't praise me, if they don't shout for me, if they don't lift up their mouths and lift up their hands and worship me, these rocks alongside the road are gonna worship me. What is significant? Jesus showed two things when he said that to the Pharisees. He said, no, I'm not gonna shut them up. The rocks would praise me if I shut them up. What does that mean? Two things. He said, I'm king. Jesus is king. To make that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, garments on the ground, palm branches waving in the air on the ground, that was an entrance of a king. But what he was also saying is that creation will worship its creator. Creation will worship its creator. Do you know that even in the book of Romans, it tells us that we as people, Whether or not we've opened our Bibles or not, we are without excuse of the evidence that God is real because we simply have to look at the world. We simply have to look at his creation and creation speaks to its creator. So Jesus is saying, yes, I am king. And even if you creation don't worship me, the rocks are gonna worship me. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 96. Let the sky sing for joy. Let the earth join in chorus. Let oceans thunder and fields echo this ecstatic praise until every swaying tree, come on, of every forest joins in, lifting up their songs of joyous praise to him. The creator was there. And the people who should have known it the most opposed it the greatest. And so I wanna talk to you because when we picture this idea of what's happening on Palm Sunday, It's a picture in our minds that moves us to emotion. It stirs our emotions. I mean, if you could picture Jesus riding in on this colt and people are laying down their garments and and they're praising and voices lifted. I mean, if you thought you felt the presence of God, right? In a church service when voices are lifted, imagine being on the scene of this. But the reality is friends, that not every heart in that crowd was for Jesus. 
Not every heart in that crowd had the same motivation for being there. Let me talk to you about motivation real quick. Motivation is having a strong reason to act or accomplish something. Many motivations. Have you ever been motivated to do something? Yeah. I've recently been motivated to do something. Uh, last month, I booked our family summer vacation, and I was excited, right? And I'm a planner. If you're a planner, I not only booked it, I looked at my packing list. Even though I'm not leaving for several months, I looked, and I'm like, what should I pack? And then as I'm thinking about what should I pack, I just kind of glance down at my, myself, and I'm like, well, what could I do? <laughs> I've got several months, and I could do something with this. And so I did not join a gym because I know what it feels like to have motivation before and make a commitment that I won't follow up on. But I did the next best thing. I went on Pinterest and I searched workouts for beginners because I'm about to make a confession to y'all. I have not done a workout program since 2010. You're like, what year is it? Yes, it's 2022. I haven't worked out since two. I go walking, I ride bikes, I enjoy activity. But my husband has no problem out of me on this stage. So you already know that I don't like running. I value my legs. I value my back. I don't like exercise. So that should not come to a surprise to you. But I'm motivated because I'm going to a beach. And I'm motivated by what could be on my packing list. And so I go on that Pinterest and I do day one. I found something really easy, you guys. It was literally just a 30-day calendar and there are seven things a day that you got to do. And you don't even have to do them twice. Like you just got to do them once. <laughs> They increase as you go on, but it's still just once. And I did day one. And I'm like, okay, I could do this. I did day two. I could do this. Day three, I couldn't do it because I got stung by a bee in my foot. The first time I've ever been stung by a bee. Should have been a sign. <laughs> because day four, I picked up where I left off. And as I am doing lunges and squats, I popped out my pelvic joint. Boop. Heard it and everything. Awesome, right? That hurt. A beginner's workout on Pinterest and I screwed it up. And so I found myself this week right here at New Spine Chiropractic. And I got adjusted. I went in there and he's like, so what brings you in today? I go, squats and lunges. <laughs> he goes, have you ever done a squat or a lunge before? I'm almost 40. Yes, I have done a squat and a lunge before, but apparently I don't do them very good. So could you put it back? And sure enough, he put it back. But I say that because my motivations are now changing a little bit. I looked at, well, what can I do with this? And I'm like, now, how can I make it browner? <laughs> can I get some self-tanner? Can I, what can I do? Because I mean, this whole workout thing isn't working out for me. But in that, in that crowd that day, you can take that down. We don't need to look at that no more. In the crowd that day, there were so many different motivations. There was a motivation for people that they wanted Jesus to be a political king. They wanted Jesus to be this national ruler. And hear me, why not? Why not on Passover week? When they're celebrating the fact that God, God saved and rescued a million plus people, the children of Israel, years and years ago, he, God literally he obliterated the enemy, Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Come on, God, wouldn't Passover week be awesome to do it again? Here comes our king on a colt and he is entering. Be our national leader. I wanna ask you, have you ever had that conversation with God where, God, this would be the perfect week for this. Lord, you made a promise that you would deliver me in this or maybe you had a promise that this was gonna come into my life. Wouldn't this be the perfect circumstances, God, for this to happen? Anyone ever been there? I have. I'm like, Lord, like I'm looking at everything. Like this would just be the most perfect surprise, but I'm not surprised because I'm actually planning it right now, but this would be awesome. So there were hundreds and thousands of hearts in that crowd that day that wanted Jesus to be the political king. But that wasn't the only motivation. Others were there because of miracles. Jesus had raised, raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was a well-known Jew. His family was well-known. And Jesus had called a dead man out of a tomb. He told him, Lazarus, come out. And here comes a man who had been dead for several days in his tomb clothes, his funeral clothes, and comes out alive and breathing. Miracles. People wanted to see signs. 
They wanted to see wonders. They were there because they were waiting for the next best thing. But I want to tell you about that because what they had was not true devotion. Because if devotion is based only on curiosity or popularity, it's going to fade quickly. So if we are here and hear me, if curiosity gets you in the room, praise God for that. Some of us ended up in a church because we were curious. Some of us ended up in a church, well, something's different about them. Let me see what happened. Some of us, it was popular, right? I see, I saw it on, on trending on social media or I like what they're doing. I like the music. I like the vibe. Popularity. But those things will fade. And when those fade, we have to do this. We get, no, that's not right. There's supposed to be another one. Devotion based on curiosity. Yep. Is there something about choices? That choices, nope. All right, I'll just say it out loud. That's okay. Choices have to be made when devotion fades. So when all the hype fades, right? Because all that's going to fade. All the, the motivation eventually is going to fade. It faded for me for working out for my trip. <laughs> You're like, girl, you only gave it one chance. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I'm a quick learner. <laughs> but when motivation fades, choices have to be made. And that's the truth. It's the truth. And too often, instead of making choices, we make compromises. Instead of making difficult choices, choices based on truth, we tend to make compromises. And I know that God doesn't want us to make compromises. He wants us to make choices. Choices based on his goodness. Choices based on his truth and the reality of who God is. But there was another motivation of heart in that place. And that was of the Pharisees because the Pharisees opposed Jesus. Opposition was their motivation. And again, these are the scholars of the book. They would have known every prophetic word pointing to the Messiah, but they had several reasons for their opposition. One, they didn't want to lose their authority. They didn't want to lose their their ruling. And even though they were under Roman reign, they still had some, some clout with Rome. They still had an in with Rome and they didn't want to lose it. So they fiercely opposed Jesus. And what I've learned is all of those motivations were going to end up in a choice that they were going to make. It was going to lead to actions. And those choices have a cost. Friends, can I tell you that our choices have a cost? And if you've ever adulted or made a choice, right, you know they have a cost. Some of us have paid awful costs for some choices that we've made in our lives. Others were reaping, right? The benefits of good choices, of good choices that we've made. But many times we find ourselves, when it comes to following Jesus, we ask this question, what will it cost me? Think about all, two million people are gonna be exposed to Jesus that day on on Palm Sunday. Two million people. And I can only imagine people asking, what is this going to cost me? If I believe in him, if I serve him, if I surrender, if I, if I get along in this plan, what is this going to cost me? Now, I want to show you a person in the Bible who had to answer that question, what is this going to cost me? And we're going to find him actually a couple years before Palm Sunday, but it's still on Passover week. So I need you to understand that Jesus had only three years of miraculous ministry just three years. He was only doing the miraculous preaching and speaking and ushering in the kingdom of God for just three years. So in the beginning of his ministry, he sparked the curiosity of a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And I want to introduce you to him. In John chapter two, it says, now when he was in Jerusalem, this is Jesus, at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Again, the motivation, right, is the miracles. Curiosity is sparking. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them. Hear me, just because people are excited for you doesn't mean they're for you. Just because they're excited in your presence, just because they're getting hyped and pumped and it seems like you guys are all on the same page, it does not mean that their hearts are for you personally. And so Jesus on his part, he didn't entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. What is he saying? He's like, I knew their hearts. I knew their hearts. Now hear me, some of us in this room are like, oh my God, he knows my heart. Yes, but you're still sitting here. You are still 
sitting here and he loves your heart and he's working on your heart and you're a work in progress and he is for your heart and not against your heart. But friends, there's nothing you can keep from God. Even the things that you refuse to address yourselves, you can't keep it from him. You know it, there's thoughts that come to our minds and immediately we dismiss them because we don't wanna go there emotionally or mentally. But God knows that. God knows that thing that we don't even want to address. So here comes Nicodemus. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher and that you come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he's recognizing, I'm seeing, remember Pastor Jeremy told us about fruits, right? You'll know them by their fruits. They knew that Jesus was something special. They couldn't quite pinpoint who or what he was, but they knew that something was different because of the fruit, because of the miracles that were coming out of his life and out of his ministry. And so what does Nicodemus do? Well, it says right here in scripture that he came to him by night. Most meetings did not take place in the evening in Jerusalem. In fact, if you are going to be meeting with someone in the days of Jesus at nighttime, it's because you don't want people to know that you are meeting. And so what Jesus did with Nicodemus is Nicodemus sought Jesus out and wanted to have an after dark conversation because he would risk losing a lot of things if people were to find out that he was going to have a conversation with this prophet, with this man, with this miraculous worker, Jesus. But something had motivated Nicodemus to curiosity. And instead of puffing up in pride and saying that this can't be, he opened his heart and he went to meet with Jesus. And I wanna show you a clip from the Chosen series that shows this rooftop, dark, private conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. What else? What have you come here to show us? A kingdom. That is what our rulers are worried about. No, not that kind. Then what? The sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. You mean a new creature? A conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. My mother, may she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That part of you, that, is what must be reborn to new life. How can these things be? Ah, my teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things, huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. I know. I know. Do you hear this? What? Listen. What do you hear? The wind? How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. I hear it sound. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the Spirit, you can recognize His effect. mind is consumed with thoughts of what a stir these words would cause among the teachers of the law. Yes, and I do not expect otherwise. I speak of what I know and have seen, and it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. So if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more of them before you are silenced. I have come to do more than speak words, Nicodemus. More miracles? Yes. But even more than that, 
But I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. Then from what? From sin. From spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this has nothing to do with Rome. It's all about sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, Nicodemus. He sent him to save it through him. It's as simple as Moses' serpent on the pole. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Have you ever heard anything like this before? When I met Lilith, Mary, that day, I told my wife and my students that she was beyond human aid. Only God could have healed her. And then I saw her healed. And here you are. The healer. I, my whole life, I have wondered if I would see this day. Follow me, and you'll see more. Where are you? Join me and my students. In two days' time, we leave Capernaum. Come see the kingdom I am bringing into this world. But I... I, I you have a position in the Sanhedrin. You have family. You are getting advanced in years. <laughs> I understand, but the invitation is still open. The invitation to what exactly? <laughs> to lead a nomadic life, to, to give up who I am. It's true. There is a lot you would give up. But what you would gain is far greater and more lasting. Is this another one of your Born again mysteries. <laughs> uh, maybe. Mm. Right. <laughs> you know, Nicodemus asked him, What will following Jesus cost me? It's literally as he's getting this invitation. Can you imagine? I mean, every week here at Avenue, Pastor Jeremy or myself, we pray for us to have an invitation to say yes to the salvation of Jesus. But can you imagine what it would have been like to sit at a table across from him and for him to look at you and say, I understand, but you still have my invitation and be personally invited by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to come do the unknown with him. See, the thing is about following Jesus is that it's not unknown to him, it's unknown to us. We don't know what it's gonna look like. We could dream and have ideas, and, but he knows. But Nicodemus sat across from him and he had to ask this question, what will following Jesus cost me? And many times we ask that same question. Sitting here in, in a congregation or maybe at home reading our Bible or driving in our car just thinking about God. What will it cost me, Lord, if I say yes in this area? What will it personally cost me to follow you in the way that you are leading me? Because hear me, friends, it starts with salvation, but that is just the entry point. The things that God can do and wants to do in and through us is limitless. But what will it cost me personally? I loved that Jesus wasn't mad at him for asking. He literally asked him, do you want me to give up who I am? Jesus doesn't get mad when we ask those questions. He doesn't get frustrated or disappointed or make us feel as if we are less than for asking. He understands, but he still invites. 
He understands, but he still invites. For Nicodemus, it was gonna cost him position and relationships. Jesus told him, I know that you are a Pharisee. I know you're part of the Sanhedrin. Do you know how proper that was? Do you know how exclusive it was who Nicodemus was able to be and operate as, as a Pharisee in a Sanhedrin? He was elite. He was, he was popular and not in a puffy way, in a humble way. People honored and respected him as a teacher, as a great teacher. Pharisees and scholars would come to sit under Nicodemus to learn from him. And yet Nicodemus humbled himself in this rooftop conversation because he knew that someone was now on earth that was greater than him. And the very thing that he had been praying for and waiting for had now arrived and he'd wondered his whole life, would he ever see it? But God is so good that he doesn't just say, Nicodemus, yes, you get to see it. He says, Nicodemus, will you join me in it? See, I love what God does to us. He doesn't say, do you see how I'm moving? Do you see what I'm doing at Avenue Church? Do you see, guys, what I'm doing in the city of Las Vegas? Do you see what I'm stirring up in the nation? Do you see my hand moving around the world? He doesn't just say, do you see it? He says, do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to join me? Because you are invited. But the honest to truth answer is, when we ask, what is it going to cost me? It's going to cost you something. In all reality, it costs us everything. But we often ask the question, what will I lose? I remember that. I was 18 years old when I gave my life to Jesus. Some of you are sitting in this room who I went to high school with, and you know I did not serve Jesus in high school. And I remember shortly after graduation, I'm in a church service because I went to church every single Sunday because that was the rule in my home, that if you lived under my mother's roof, you were in the car on Sunday morning to go to church Pajamas are not, teeth brushed are not, on time, we're leaving and you're going. And so I was there every Sunday, but there was one particular Sunday that my, my life had the opportunity to be changed. And I remember thinking, what am I going to lose? I thought of the boyfriend who I wasn't living an appropriate God-honoring relationship with. That's got to go. I thought of the friends who I did illegal things with. That was going to have to go. I started the conning the cost of what I would lose. And now I've been a Christ follower for 20 years. And looking back, the things that I was afraid, afraid of losing are in no comparison to what the Lord has done in and through my life. But I say all that because I can level with you. I know what it's like to think of what will I lose if I give him my yes. Maybe for some of you, God is calling you to the nations. Maybe God is calling you to step out of a work environment that you've been so comfortable and familiar in, and you're wondering, what will I lose? See, Jesus gave Nicodemus such a beautiful invitation to, to follow him, to join him. And I want us to see real quick what happens with Nicodemus. Be everyone. Everyone's here? Yes, this is all of us. Is there anyone else? <laughs> you came so close. What do you mean? We need the gopher to make it to a camp in Tiberius by nightfall. Simon is correct. Now the Chosen series, there's a lot of ambiguity when it came to Nicodemus. And so they really dug deep into what they thought this character would be. So we actually don't see this interaction play out in scripture. 
But I love that they did this because this is so like you and me. That how many times have we been given an invitation to something bigger than ourselves, but something held us back? I love how the chosen captured the emotions and the struggle of what is holding me back. And I would ask you today, what is holding me back? What holds you back? What's that thing that keeps your foot in the door instead of moving forward to things that God has asked you to do? What is in scripture in the story of Nicodemus is that this happened in John chapter three. I think it's fascinating that one of our greatest scriptures in Christianity is for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever should believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That came from that conversation. <sighs> Nicodemus heard a scripture that you and I have memorized, that we base our lives on, that our hope is placed on. He heard it from the lips of Jesus. And although Nicodemus did not follow the Lord in ministry, he did stand before the Pharisees in John chapter seven and told them, you cannot judge for someone unless you've placed them on trial. So he stood up verbally trying to create time for Jesus. But hear me friends, the next time that Jesus and Nicodemus had an interaction was after Jesus was crucified. And in secret, Nicodemus came with another man, Joseph of Arimathea, and he put oil and, and scents on Jesus's dead body. He helped wrap him in linens. He helped anoint him and he covered him in spices. That would break me because I don't want to work with a dead body of Jesus. I wanna walk alongside the resurrected living King. I wanna see the ministry. I wanna see people healed and transformed and set free. I wanna sit with broken widows and hear their stories and believe that God is a God of eternity and that we can have hope together. I don't want to just handle the aftermath. I wanna be in the mix. Now hear me, Nicodemus did risk covering his body in oil and spices. He did that in secret. He would have been shamed for honoring the body of Jesus. But I don't wanna honor in secret, I wanna live in private. I wanna live in public. I don't wanna honor in the private. I don't wanna just lift my hands in the, the safety of these four walls. I wanna worship him wherever I am. And so I wanna ask you, instead of asking ourselves, what will I lose? What if we asked, what will I gain? What if we changed it? What if we changed it? Instead of what will I lose? What will I gain? And I love what Jesus said to Nicodemus. There's a lot you would give up, but what you would gain is far greater and more lasting. If you could just take a moment and look back on your life and you think of some of, about some of the choices that you've made, how many things do you have to be grateful for? For your yeses to the Lord. I have so much to be grateful in the last 20 years. I've lost some stuff. Lost friends, I've lost some family. lost, but what I have gained is in no comparison to the things that I gave up. The apostle Paul says it best in Philippians chapter three, and you can go home and, and sit in that today. In Philippians chapter three, Paul says that in everything in my life, all of my achievements, I consider them rubbish to now knowing Jesus. Everything that I did before him, all the accolades, all the accomplishments, the schooling, the work, the everything, it's nothing compared to knowing Christ is my Lord and Savior. And so I wanna ask you, is God inviting you to more? What if you just asked yourself that? Is God inviting me to more? because you have a choice. Remember, motivations fade, but
but choices have to be made. And am I going to choose to give God my yes, even if it's a hesitant yes? Because I know that he's good and he's true and he's working things out. Would you stand with me, please? We're not gonna end today with a a big ending because I wanna reflect more of the intimacy that Jesus had with Nicodemus. That I don't want an emotional response. I don't want our motivation to come from guilt or our motivation to come from some stirring thoughts and emotions. I want us to ask ourselves, is God inviting me to more? So would you just close your eyes for just a moment? And would you picture yourself at a table and it's nighttime and maybe you hear a little bit of that wind, you feel a little bit of that breeze on your face and you can feel the wood of the table that you're sitting at and right across from you is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of all things is humbly sitting across from you and he's asking you, will you come and follow me for more? Mm. I believe that God is so good that he's all powerful, all knowing, and he's everywhere, that he knows every single person in this room. And he has had specific plans and purposes for every single person in this room. So where me being Lindsay is simply human, I don't know what God has been asking of you, but you do. And I believe right now is a wonderful time for you to count the cost. And my hope would be for you, not that of Nicodemus, of hesitation and regret, but more like Paul, who says nothing compares to knowing you, to walking with you. If you are here today and you're saying, yes, I want my response to Jesus to be yes, I believe God is inviting me for more and I wanna go, I wanna follow. If that is you, I wanna pray for you. Would you raise your hand? God is inviting me for more. Just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. It could be He's calling you to something new. It could be He's asking you for your heart. It could be that God is asking you to release something that you've been holding on to. Much like Nicodemus, He says, am I gonna lose who I am? You're not gonna lose who you are. You're gonna be realigned with who you were meant to be in the mighty name of Jesus. So let's pray today. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness. And I thank you, Lord, that you are calling people to more. And I just ask God for courage. You told Joshua, when Joshua was going to lead his people into the promised land, you told him to be strong and courageous for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. I pray for those who are responding that yes, God is asking more of me and I want to follow him. I am asking Jesus that you would give them strength and boldness strength and courage to do what you've called them to do. Father, I pray this week that we would take time to get alone with you and we would be solidified, God, that you have plans for good for us, plans for a hope and a future, plans that are not going to harm us, but they're going to spur us on. And I ask that we would be motivated, Father, to go after you, but that we would make choices we would choose to follow you where you call us to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, amen and amen. Before Pastor Jeremy steps up and closes this thing out, I wanna invite you, the chosen are doing something really awesome. If you watch two episodes every night for the next for the next several nights leading up to Easter, you would have completed seasons one and two and preparing for Easter. So if you're like, God, I wanna get my heart a little bit more. I wanna get more engaged. I encourage you, join me. I'm gonna be doing it too. Two episodes a night starting today and let's see the gospels. Come on, come to life and let's be ready to celebrate our resurrected Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.